Part One of Into the Valley of Death, Crimea, Balaclava, The Light Brigade, Russell, Tennyson, and Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Into the Valley of Death, Crimea, Balaclava, The Light Brigade, Russell, Tennyson, and Kipling by Various part one three poems and a bugle call the charge of the light brigade by alfred lord tennyson half a league half a league half a league onward all in the valley of death rode the six hundred forward the light brigade charge for the guns he said into the valley of death rode the six hundred forward the light brigade was there a man dismayed not though the soldier knew some one had blundered there's not to make reply there's not to reason why there's but to do and die into the valley of death rode the six hundred cannon to the right of them cannon to the left of them cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered stormed at with shot and shell boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred flashed all their sabres bare flashed as they turned in air sabring the gunners there charging an army while all the world wondered plunged in the battery smoke right through the line they broke cossack and russian reeled from the sabre stroke shattered and sundered then they rode back but not not the six hundred cannon to right of them cannon to left of them cannon behind them volleyed and thundered stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell all that was left of them left of six hundred when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honour the charge they made honour the light brigade noble six hundred the charge of the heavy brigade at balaclava october twenty five eighteen fifty four by alfred lord tennyson the charge of the gallant three hundred the heavy brigade down the hill down the hill thousands of russians thousands of horsemen drew to the valley and stayed for scarlet and scarlet's three hundred were riding by when the points of the russian lances arose in the sky and he called left wheel into line and they wheeled and obeyed then he looked at the host that had halted he knew not why and he turned half round and he bade his trumpeters sound to the charge and he rode on ahead as he waved his blade to the gallant three hundred whose glory will never die follow and up the hill up the hill up the hill followed the heavy brigade the trumpet the gallop the charge and the might of the fight thousands of horsemen had gathered there on the height with a wing pushed out to the left and a wing to the right and who shall escape if they close but he dashed up alone through the great grey slope of men swayed his sabre and held his own like an englishman there and then all in a moment followed with force three that were next in their fiery course wedged themselves in between horse and horse fought for their lives in the narrow gap they had made four amid thousands and up the hill up the hill galloped the gallant three hundred the heavy brigade fell like a cannon shot burst like a thunderbolt crashed like a hurricane broke through the mass from below drove through the midst of the foe plunged up and down to and fro rode flashing blow upon blow brave enniskillens and greys whirling their sabres in circles of light 
and some of us all in amaze who were held for a while from the sight and were only standing at gaze when the dark muffled russian crowd folded its wings from the left and the right and rolled them round like a cloud oh mad for the charge and the battle were we when our own good redcoats sank from sight like drops of blood in a dark grey sea and we turned to each other whispering all dismayed lost are the gallant three hundred of scarlet's brigade lost one and all were the words muttered in our dismay but they rode like victors and lords through the forest of lances and swords in the heart of the russian hordes they rode or they stood at bay struck with the sword hand and slew down with the bridle hand drew the foe from the saddle and threw under foot there in the fray ranged like a storm or stood like a rock in the wave of a stormy day till suddenly shock upon shock staggered the mass from without drove it in wild disarray for our men galloped up with a cheer and a shout and the foemen surged and wavered and reeled up the hill up the hill up the hill out of the field and over the brow and away glory to each and to all and the charge that they made glory to all the three hundred and all the brigade the last of the light brigade by rudyard kipling there were thirty million english who talked of england's might there were twenty broken troopers who lacked a bed for the night they had neither food nor money they had neither service nor trade they were only shiftless soldiers the last of the light brigade they felt that life was fleeting they knew not that art was long that though they were dying of famine they lived in deathless song they asked for a little money to keep the wolf from the door and the thirty million english sent twenty pounds and four they laid their heads together that were scarred and lined and grey keen were the russian sabres but want was keener than they and an old troop sergeant muttered let us go to the man who writes the things on balaclava the kiddies at school recites they went without bands or colors a regiment ten file strong to look for the master singer who had crowned them all in his song and waiting his servant's order by the garden gate they stayed a desolate little cluster the last of the light brigade they strove to stand to attention to straighten the toil bowed back they drilled on an empty stomach the loose knit files fell slack with stooping of weary shoulders in garments tattered and frayed they shambled into his presence the last of the light brigade the old troop sergeant was spokesman and begging your pardon he said you rode of the light brigade sir here's all that isn't dead and it's all come true what you wrote sir regarding the mouth of hell for we're all of us nigh to the workhouse and we thought we'd call and tell no thank you we don't want food sir but couldn't you take and write a sort of to be continued and see next page of the fight we think that someone has blundered and couldn't you tell em how you wrote we were heroes once sir please write we are starving now the poor little army departed limping and lean and forlorn and the heart of the master singer grew hot with the scorn of scorn and he wrote for them wonderful verses that swept the land like flame till the fatted souls of the english were scourged with a thing called shame o oh, thirty million english that babble of england's might behold there are twenty heroes who lack their food to-night our children's children are lisping to honour the charge they made and we leave to the streets and the workhouse the charge of the light brigade i am trumpeter Lamfrey, one of the surviving trumpeters charged the light ballot I am now going to sound the bugle that was sounded at Waterloo and sound the charge that was sounded at Balaclava on that very same bugle. 
the 25th of October, 8.54. Record made at Edison House, Northumberland Avenue, London, August 2nd, 1890. End of part one. Part two of Into the Valley of Death, Crimea, Balaclava, The Light Brigade, Russell, Tennyson, and Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two, excerpt from The British Expedition to the Crimea, 1858, by William Howard Russell. Lord Raglan sent orders to Lord Lucan to cover the approaches, and his heavy horse were just moving from their position near the vineyard and orchard when he saw a body of the enemy's cavalry coming after him over the ridge. Lord Lucan rode after his cavalry, wheeled them around, and ordered them to advance against the enemy. The Russians, evidently corps d'élite, their light blue jackets embroidered with silver lace, were advancing at an easy gallop towards the brow of the hill. A forest of lances glistened in their rear, and several squadrons of grey-coated dragoons moved up quickly to support them as they reached the summit. The instant they came in sight, the trumpets of our cavalry gave out the warning blast which told us all that in another moment we should see the shock of battle beneath our very eyes lord raglan all of his staff and escort and groups of officers the zouaves french generals and officers and bodies of french infantry on the height were spectators of the scene as though they were looking on the stage from the boxes of a theatre every one dismounted and not a word was said the russians advanced down the hill at a slow canter which they changed to a trot and at last nearly halted the trumpets rang out again through the valley and the greys and enniskilliners went right at the centre of the russian cavalry the space between them was only a few hundred yards it was scarce enough to let the horses gather way nor had the men quite space sufficient for the full play of their sword arms the russian line brought forward each wing as our cavalry advanced and threatened to annihilate them as they passed on turning a little to the left so as to meet the russian right the greys rushed in with a cheer that thrilled to every heart the wild shout of the enniskilliners rose through the air at the same instant as lightning flashes through a cloud the greys and the enniskilliners pierced through the dark masses of russians the shock was but for a moment there was a clash of steel and a light play of sword blades in the air and then the greys and the red coats disappeared in the midst of the shaken and quivering column the first line of russians which had been smashed by and had fled off at one flank towards the centre were coming back to swallow up our handful of men by sheer steel and sheer courage enniskilliner and scott were winning their way right through the enemy's squadrons and already grey horses and red coats appeared at the rear mass when the fourth dragoon guards riding at the right flank of the russians and the fifth dragoon guards following close after the enniskilliners rushed at the enemy and put them to utter rout a cheer burst from every lip in the enthusiasm officers and men took off their caps and shouted with delight and thus keeping up the scenic character of their positions they clapped their hands again and again lord waglan at once dispatched lieutenant curzon aide-de-camp to convey his congratulations to brigadier-general scarlett and to say well done the russian cavalry followed by our shot retired in confusion leaving the ground covered with horses and men at ten o'clock the guards and highlanders of the first division were seen moving towards the plains from their camp the duke of cambridge came up to lord raglan for orders and his lordship ready to give the honour of the day to sir colin campbell who commanded at balaclava told his royal highness to place himself under the direction of the brigadier 
at forty minutes after ten the fourth division also took up their position in advance of balaclava the cavalry were then on the left front of our position facing the enemy the light cavalry brigade en echelon in reserve with guns on the right the fourth royal irish the fifth dragoon guards and greys on the left of the brigade the enniskillens and first royals on the right the fourth division took up ground in the centre the guards and highlanders filed off towards the extreme right and faced the redoubts from which the russians opened on them with artillery which was silenced by the rifle skirmishers under lieutenant godfrey at fifty minutes after ten general canrobert attended by his staff and brigadier-general rose rode up to lord raglan and the staffs of the two generals and their escorts mingled in praise of the magnificent charge of our cavalry while the chiefs apart conversed over the operations of the day which promised to be one of battle at fifty-five minutes after ten a body of cavalry the chasseurs d'afrique passed down to the plain and were loudly cheered by our men they took up ground in advance of the ridges on our left soon after occurred the glorious catastrophe the quartermaster-general brigadier airy thinking that the light cavalry had not gone far enough in front gave an order in writing to captain nolan fifteenth hussars to take to lord lucan a braver soldier than captain nolan the army did not possess he was known for his entire devotion to his profession and for his excellent work on our drill and system of remount and breaking horses he entertained the most exalted opinions respecting the capabilities of the english horse soldier the british hussar and dragoon could break square take batteries ride over columns and pierce any other cavalry as if they were made of straw he thought they had missed even such chances as had been offered to them that in fact they were in some measure disgraced a matchless horseman and a first-rate swordsman he held in contempt i am afraid even grape and canister he rode off with his orders to lord lucan when lord lucan received the order from captain nolan and had read it he asked we are told where are we to advance to captain nolan pointed with his finger in the direction of the russians and according to the statements made after his death said there are the enemy and there are the guns or words to that effect the charge of balaclava lord raglan had only in the morning ordered lord lucan to move from the position he had taken near the centre redoubt to the left of the second line of redoubts occupied by the turks seeing that the ninety-third and invalids were cut off from the cavalry lord raglan sent another order to lord lucan to send his heavy horse towards balaclava and that officer was executing it just as the russian horse came over the ridge the heavy cavalry charge then took place and afterwards the men dismounted on the scene after an interval of half an hour lord raglan again sent an order to lord lucan cavalry to advance and take advantage of any opportunity to recover the heights they will be supported by infantry which has been ordered to advance upon two fronts lord raglan's reading of this order was that the infantry had been ordered to advance on two fronts it does not appear that the infantry had received orders to advance the duke of cambridge and sir g cathcart stated they were not in receipt of such instruction lord lucan advanced his cavalry to the ridge close to number five redoubt and while there received from captain nolan an order which as follows lord raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front follow the enemy and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns troops of horse artillery may accompany french cavalry is on your left immediate lord lucan gave the order to lord cardigan to advance upon the guns conceiving that his orders compelled him to do so the noble earl saw the fearful odds against him it is a maxim of war that cavalry never act without a support infantry should be close at hand when cavalry carry guns as the effect is only instantaneous and should always be placed on the flank of a line of cavalry the only support our light cavalry had was the heavy cavalry at a great distance behind them the infantry and guns being far in the rear 
there were no squadrons in column there was a plain to charge over before the enemy's guns could be reached of a mile and a half in length at ten minutes past eleven our light cavalry brigade advanced the whole brigade scarcely made one effective regiment according to the numbers of continental armies and yet it was more than we could spare they swept proudly past glittering in the morning sun in all the pride and splendor of war they advanced in two lines quickened their pace as they closed towards the enemy at the distance of twelve hundred yards the whole line of the enemy belched forth from thirty iron mouths a flood of smoke and flame the flight was marked by instant gaps in our ranks by dead men and horses by steeds flying wounded or riderless across the plain in diminished ranks with a halo of steel above their heads and with a cheer which was many a noble fellow's death cry they flew into the smoke of the batteries but ere they were lost from view the plain was strewed with their bodies through the clouds of smoke we could see their sabres flashing as they rode between the guns cutting down the gunners as they stood we saw them riding through returning after breaking through a column of russians and scattering them like chaff when the flank fire of the batteries on the hill swept them down wounded men and dismounted troopers flying towards us told the sad tale at the very moment a regiment of lancers was hurled upon their flank colonel shoal of the eighth hussars whose attention was drawn to them by lieutenant phillips saw the danger and rode his few men straight at them it was as much as our heavy cavalry brigade could do to cover the retreat of the miserable remnants of that band of heroes as they returned to the place they had so lately quitted in all the pride of life at thirty-five minutes past eleven not a british soldier except the dead and dying was left in front of those muscovite guns the heavy cavalry in columns of squadrons moved slowly backwards covering the retreat of the broken men the ground was left covered with our men and with hundreds of russians and we could see the cossacks busy searching the dead our infantry made a forward movement towards the redoubts after the cavalry came in and the russian infantry in advance slowly retired towards the gorge at the same time the french cavalry pushed forward on their right and held them in check pushing out a line of skirmishers and forcing them to withdraw their guns captain nolan was killed by the first shot fired as he rode in advance of the first line lord cardigan received a lance thrust through his clothes while the affair was going on the french cavalry made a most brilliant charge at the battery on our left and cut down the gunners but they could not get off the guns and had to retreat with the loss of two captains and fifty men killed and wounded out of their little force of two hundred chasseurs the russians from the redoubt continued to harass us and the first division were ordered to lie down in two lines the fourth division covered by the rising ground and two regiments of french infantry which had arrived in the valley followed by artillery moved onwards to operate on the russian right already threatened by the french cavalry the russians threw out skirmishers to meet the french skirmishers and the french contented themselves with keeping their position at eleven a m the russians feeling alarmed at our steady advance and at the symptoms of our intention to turn or cut off their right retired from number one redoubt which was taken possession of by the allies at fifteen minutes past eleven they abandoned redoubt number two blowing up the magazine and as we still continued to advance they blew up and abandoned number three at forty-five minutes past eleven but to our great regret we could not prevent their taking off seven out of nine guns in the works at forty-eight minutes past eleven the russian infantry began to retire a portion crept up the hills behind the first redoubt which still belonged to them 
the artillery on the right of the first division fired shot and rockets at the first redoubt but could not do much good nor could the heavy guns of the batteries near the town carry so far as to annoy the russians at twelve o'clock the greater portion of the french and english moved on and an accession to the artillery was made by two french batteries pushed on towards the front of our left the first division remained still in line along the route to balaclava from twelve to fifteen minutes passed not a shot was fired on either side but the russians gathered up their forces towards the heights over the gorge and still keeping their cavalry on the plain manoeuvred in front on our right a harmless attack at twenty-eight minutes after twelve the allies again got into motion with the exception of the first division which moved en echelon towards the opposite hills keeping their right wing well before balaclava at forty minutes after twelve captain calthorpe was sent by lord raglan with orders which altered the disposition of our front for the french at one p m showed further up on our left as our object was solely to keep balaclava we had no desire to bring on a general engagement and as the russians would not advance but kept their cavalry in front of the approach to the mountain passes it became evident the action was over the cannonade which began again at a quarter past twelve and continued with very little effect ceased altogether at a quarter past one the two armies retained their respective positions lord raglan continued on the hillside all day watching the enemy it was dark ere he returned to his quarters with the last gleam of day he could see the sheen of the enemy's lances in their old position in the valley and their infantry gradually crowned the heights on their left and occupied the road to the village which is beyond balaclava to the southward our guards were moving back as i passed them and the tired french and english were replaced by a french division which marched down to the valley at five o'clock we had thirteen officers killed or taken a hundred and sixty-two men killed or taken twenty-seven officers wounded two hundred and twenty-four men wounded total killed wounded and missing four hundred and twenty-six horses killed or missing three hundred and ninety-four horses wounded a hundred and twenty six total five hundred and twenty end of part two part three of into the valley of death crimea balaclava the light brigade russell tennyson and kipling this librivox recording is in the public domain part three excerpt from the london gazette for twelve november eighteen fifty four from lord raglan commander-in-chief to the war department the duke of newcastle war department november twelve eighteen fifty four four o'clock p m his grace the duke of newcastle has this day received two dispatches with enclosures of which the following are copies addressed to his grace by general the lord raglan g c b number eighty five before sevastopol october twenty eighth eighteen fifty four my lord duke i have the honour to acquaint your grace that the enemy attacked the position in the front of balaclava at an early hour on the morning of the twenty fifth instant the low range of heights that runs across the plains at the bottom of which the town is placed was protected by four small redoubts hastily constructed three of these had guns in them and on a higher hill in front of the village of camara in advance of our right flank was established a work of somewhat more importance these several redoubts were garrisoned by turkish troops no other force being at my disposal for their occupation the ninety-third highlanders was the only british regiment in the plain with the exception of a part of a battalion of detachments composed of weekly men and a battery of artillery belonging to the third division and on the heights behind our right were placed the marines obligingly landed from the fleet by vice-admiral dundas all these including the turkish troops were under the immediate orders of major-general sir colin campbell whom i have taken from the first division with the ninety-third 
as soon as i was apprised of this movement of the enemy i felt compelled to withdraw from before sebastopol the first and fourth divisions commanded by lieutenant generals his royal highness the duke of cambridge and the honourable sir george cathcart and bring them down into the plain and general camrobert subsequently reinforced these troops with the first division of french infantry and the chasseurs d'afrique the enemy commenced their operation by attacking the work on our side of the village of camara and after very little resistance carried it they likewise got possession of the three others in contiguity to it being opposed only in one and that but for a very short space of time the farthest of the three they did not retain but the immediate abandonment of the others enabled them to take possession of the guns in them amounting in the whole to seven those in the three lesser force were spiked by the one english artilleryman who was in each the russian cavalry at once advanced supported by artillery in very great strength one portion of them assailed the front and right flank of the ninety third and were instantly driven back by the vigorous and steady fire of that distinguished regiment under lieutenant colonel ainsley the other and larger mass turned towards her majesty's heavy cavalry and afforded brigadier general scarlett under the guidance of lieutenant general the earl of lucan the opportunity of inflicting upon them a most signal defeat the ground was very unfavourable for the attack of our dragoons but no obstacle was sufficient to check their advance and they charged into the russian column which soon sought safety in flight although far superior in numbers the charge of this brigade was one of the most successful i ever witnessed was never for a moment doubtful and is in the highest degree creditable to brigadier general scarlett and the officers and men engaged in it as the enemy withdrew from the ground which they had momentarily occupied i directed the cavalry supported by the fourth division under lieutenant-general sir george cathcart to move forward and take advantage of any opportunity to regain the heights and not before being able to accomplish this immediately and it appearing that an attempt was making to remove the captured guns the earl of lucan was desired to advance rapidly follow the enemy in their retreat and try to prevent them from effecting their objects in the meanwhile the russians had time to reform on their own ground with artillery in front and upon their flanks from some misconception of the instruction to advance the lieutenant-general considered that he was bound to attack at all hazards and he accordingly ordered major-general the earl of cardigan to move forward with the light brigade this order was obeyed in the most spirited and gallant manner lord cardigan charged with the utmost vigour attacked a battery which was firing upon the advancing squadrons and having passed beyond it engaged the russian cavalry in its rear but there his troops were assailed by artillery and infantry as well as cavalry and necessarily retired after having committed much havoc upon the enemy they effected this movement without haste or confusion but the loss they have sustained has i deeply lament been very severe in officers men and horses only counterbalanced by the brilliancy of the attack and the gallantry order and discipline which distinguished it forming a striking contrast to the conduct of the enemy's cavalry which had previously been engaged with the heavy brigade the chasseurs d'afrique advanced on our left and gallantly charged a russian battery which checked its fire for a time and thus rendered the british cavalry an essential service i have the honour to enclose copies of sir colin campbell's and the earl of lucan's reports i beg to draw your grace's attention to the terms in which sir colin campbell speaks of lieutenant colonel ainsley of the ninety third and captain barker of the royal artillery and also to the praise bestowed by the earl of lucan on major-general the earl of cardigan and brigadier-general scarlett which they most fully deserve the earl of lucan not having sent me the names of the other officers who distinguished themselves i propose to forward them by the next opportunity 
the enemy made no further movement in advance and at the close of the day the brigade of guards of the first division and the fourth division returned to their original encampment as did the french troops with the exception of one brigade of the first division which general camrobert was so good as to leave in support of sir colin campbell the remaining regiments of the highland brigade also remained in the valley the fourth division had advanced close to the heights and sir george cathcart caused one of the redoubts to be reoccupied by the turks affording them his support and he availed himself of the opportunity to assist with his riflemen in silencing two of the enemy's guns the means of defending the extensive position which had been occupied by the turkish troops in the morning having proved wholly inadequate i deemed it necessary in concurrence with general camrobert to withdraw from the lower range of heights and to concentrate our force which will be increased by a considerable body of seamen to be landed from the ships under the authority of admiral dundas immediately in front of the narrow valley leading into balaclava and upon the precipitous heights on our right thus affording a narrower line of defence i have and so on and so on raglan his grace the duke of newcastle and so on and so on enclosures from lord lucan commander of the cavalry to lord raglan balaclava october twenty seventh eighteen fifty four my lord i have the honour to report that the cavalry division under my command was seriously engaged with the enemy on the twenty fifth instant during the greater part of which day it was under a heavy fire that it made a most triumphant charge against a very superior number of the enemy's cavalry and an attack upon batteries which for daring and gallantry could not be exceeded the loss however in officers men and horses has been most severe from half past six in the morning when the horse artillery first opened fire till the enemy had possessed itself of all the different forts the cavalry constantly changing their positions continued giving all the support they could to the turkish troops though much exposed to the fire of heavy guns and riflemen when they took post on the left of the second line of redoubts by an order from your lordship the heavy brigade had soon to return to the support of the troops defending balaclava and was fortunate enough in being at hand when a large force of russian cavalry was descending the hill i immediately ordered brigadier-general scarlett to attack with the scots greys and inniskellen dragoons and had his attack supported in second line by the fifth dragoon guards and by a flank attack of the fourth dragoon guards under every disadvantage of ground these eight small squadrons succeeded in defeating and dispersing a body of cavalry estimated at three times their number and more the heavy brigade having now joined the light brigade the division took up a position with a view of supporting an attack upon the heights when being instructed to make a rapid advance to our front to prevent the enemy carrying the guns lost by the turkish troops in the morning i ordered the light brigade to advance in two lines and supported them with the heavy brigade this attack of the light cavalry was very brilliant and daring exposed to a fire from heavy batteries on their front and two flanks they advanced unchecked until they reached the batteries of the enemy and cleared them of their gunners and only retired when they found themselves engaged with a very superior force of cavalry in the rear major-general the earl of cardigan led this attack in the most gallant and intrepid manner and his lordship has expressed himself to me as admiring in the highest degree the courage and zeal of every officer non-commissioned officer and man that assisted the heavy brigade advanced to the support of the attack under a very galling fire from the batteries and infantry in a redoubt and acted with most perfect steadiness and in a manner to deserve all praise the losses my lord it grieves me to state have been very great indeed and i fear will be much felt by your lordship 
i cannot too strongly recommend to your lordship the two general officers commanding the brigades all the officers in command of regiments and also the divisional and brigade staffs indeed the conduct of every individual of every rank i feel to be deserving of my entire praise and i hope of your lordship's approbation the conduct of the royal horse artillery troops first under the command of captain maud and after that officer was severely wounded of captain shakespeare was most meritorious and praiseworthy i received from these officers every possible assistance during the time they respectively commanded i have and so on and so on lucan lieutenant general commanding cavalry division his excellency the commander of the forces and so on and so on from general colin campbell to general escort adjutant general camp battery number no. four balaclava october twenty seventh eighteen fifty four sir i have the honor to inform you that on the morning of the twenty fifth instant about seven o'clock the russian force which has been as i already reported for some time amongst the hills on our right front debouched into the open ground in front of the redoubts numbers one two and three which were occupied by turkish infantry and artillery and armed with seven twelve pounders iron the enemy's force consisted of eighteen or nineteen battalions of infantry from thirty to forty guns and a large body of cavalry the attack was made against number one redoubt by a cloud of skirmishers supported by eight battalions of infantry and sixteen guns the turkish troops in number one persisted as long as they could and then retired and they suffered considerable loss in their retreat this attack was followed by the successive abandonment of numbers two three and four redoubts by the turks as well as of the other posts held by them in our front the guns however in numbers two three and four were spiked the garrisons of these redoubts retired and some of them formed on the right and some on the left flank of the ninety-third highlanders which was posted in front of number four battery and the village of Caccioli when the enemy had taken possession of these redoubts their artillery advanced with a large mass of cavalry and their guns ranged to the ninety-third highlanders which with one hundred invalids under the lieutenant colonel daphne in support occupied very insufficiently from the smallness of their numbers the slightly rising ground in front of number four battery as i found that round shot and shell began to cause some casualties among the ninety-third islanders and the turkish battalions on their right and left flank i made them retire a few paces behind the crest of the hill during this period our batteries on the hills manned by the royal marine artillery and the royal marines made most excellent practice on the enemy's cavalry which came over the hill ground in front one body of them amounting to about four hundred men turned to their left separating themselves from those who attacked lord lucan's division and charged the ninety-third highlanders who immediately advanced to the crest of the hill and opened their fire which forced the russian cavalry to give way and turn to their left after which they made an attempt to turn the right flank of the ninety-third having observed the flight of the turks who were placed there upon which the grenadiers of the ninety-third under captain ross were wheeled up to their right and fired on the enemy which manoeuvre completely discomfited them during the rest of the day the troops under my command received no further molestation from the russians i beg to call lord raglan's attention to the gallantry and eagerness of the ninety-third highlanders under lieutenant colonel ainsley of which probably his lordship was an eye-witness as well as the admirable conduct of captain barker and the officers of the field artillery under his orders who made most excellent practice against the russian cavalry and artillery while within range i have and so on signed colin campbell major-general to brigadier-general escort adjutant-general from general george de lacy evans to lord raglan second division heights of the cherney october twenty seventh eighteen fifty four my lord 
Yesterday, the enemy attacked this division with several columns of infantry supported by artillery. Their cavalry did not come to the front. Their masses, covered by large bodies of skirmishers, advanced with much apparent confidence. The division immediately formed line in advance of our camp, the left under Major General Pinnefather, the right under Brigadier General Adams. Lieutenant Colonel Fitzmyer and the captains of batteries, Turner and Yates, promptly posted their guns and opened fire upon the enemy. Immediately on the cannonade being heard, the Duke of Cambridge brought up to our support the brigade of guards under Major General Bentick, with a battery under Lieutenant Colonel Dacres. His Royal Highness took post in advance of our right to secure that flank, and rendered me throughout the most effective and important assistance general bosquet with similar promptitude and from a greater distance approached our position with five french battalions sir g cathcart hastened to us with a regiment of rifles and sir g brown pushed forward two guns in cooperation by our left the enemy came on at first rapidly assisted by their guns on the mound hill our pickets then chiefly of the forty ninth and thirtieth regiments resisted them with very remarkable determination and firmness lieutenant connolly of the forty ninth greatly distinguished himself as did captain bailey of the thirtieth and captain atcherley all of whom i regret to say were severely wounded sergeant sullivan also displayed at this point great bravery in the meantime our eighteen guns in position including those of the first division were served with the utmost energy in half an hour they forced the enemy's artillery to abandon the field our batteries were then directed with equal accuracy and vigor upon the enemy's columns which exposed also to the close fire of our advanced infantry soon fell into complete disorder and flight they were then literally chased by the thirtieth and ninety-fifth regiments over the ridges and down towards the head of the bay so eager was the pursuit that it was with difficulty major general pinnefather eventually effected the recall of our men these regiments and the pickets were led gallantly by major mulaverer major champion major eman and major hume they were similarly pursued further towards our right by four companies of the forty first led gallantly by lieutenant colonel the hon p herbert a q m g the forty seventh also contributed the fifty fifth were held in reserve above eighty prisoners fell into our hands and about a hundred and thirty of the enemy's dead were left within or near our position it is computed that their total loss could scarcely be less than six hundred our loss i am sorry to say has been above eighty of whom twelve killed five officers wounded i am happy to say hopes are entertained that lieutenant connolly will recover but his wound is dangerous i will have the honour of transmitting to your lordship a list of officers non-commissioned officers and privates whose conduct attracted special notice that of the pickets excited general admiration to major general pinnefeather and brigadier general adams i was as usual greatly indebted of lieutenant colonel dacres lieutenant colonel fitzmyer captains turner yates woodham and hemlin and the whole of the royal artillery we are under the greatest obligation lieutenant colonel herbert a q m g rendered the division as he always does highly distinguished and energetic services lieutenant colonel wilbram a a g while serving most actively i regret to say had a very severe fall from his horse i beg leave also to recommend to your lordship's favourable consideration the excellent services of captains glassbrook and thompson of the quartermaster general's department the brigade majors captains armstrong and thackwell and my personal staff captains alex gubbins and the hon w boyle i have and so on and so on de lacy evans lieutenant-general to general the right honourable lord raglan g c b from lord raglan to the war department the duke of newcastle number eighty six before sevastopol october twenty eighth eighteen fifty four my lord duke 
I have nothing particular to report to your grace respecting the operations of the siege since I wrote to you on the 23rd instant. The fire has been somewhat less constant, and our casualties have been fewer, though I regret to say that Captain Childers, a very promising officer of the Royal Artillery, was killed on the evening of the 23rd, and I have just heard that Major Dalton of the 49th, of whom Lieutenant General Sir de Lacey Evans entertained a very high opinion, was killed in the trenches last night. The enemy moved out of Sevastopol on the 26th with a large force of infantry, cavalry, and artillery, amounting, it is said, to 6,000 or 7,000 men, and attacked the left of the 2nd Division, commanded by Lieutenant General Sir de Lacey Evans, who speedily and energetically repulsed them, assisted by one of the batteries of the 1st Division and some guns of the Light Division, and supported by the Brigade of Guards and by several regiments of the 4th Division, and in rear by the French Division, commanded by General Bosquet, who was most eager in his desire to give him every aid. I have the honour to transmit a copy of Sir de Lacey Evans' report, which I am sure your grace will read with the highest satisfaction, and I beg to recommend the officers whom he particularly mentions to your protection. Captain Bailey of the 30th, and Captain Atcherley of the same regiment, and Lieutenant Connolly of the 49th, all of whom are severely wounded, appear to have greatly distinguished themselves i cannot speak in too high terms of the manner in which lieutenant-general sir de lacey evans met this very serious attack i had not the good fortune to witness it myself being occupied in front of balaclava at the time it commenced and having only reached his position as the affair ceased but i am certain i speak the sentiments of all who witnessed the operation in saying that nothing could have been better managed and that the greatest credit is due to the lieutenant-general whose services and conduct i have before had to bring under your grace's notice i enclose the return of the losses the army has sustained since the twenty second i have and so on and so forth raglan his grace the duke of newcastle and so forth End of Part 3 End of Into the Valley of Death, Crimea, Balaclava, The Light Brigade, Russell, Tennyson, and Kipling